Welcome to the Burn Bootcamp Podcast, where you'll find the motivation, inspiration, and empowerment that leads to real transformation. The lifelong kind. Keep listening and keep moving, Burn Nation. All right, guys, welcome back to the Burn Boot Camp Podcast. We are excited to have you here listening to Devin and I. We are back on the mic together. And what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about hard things. Things that you look at and you're like, "Mm mm-mm. But then we want to tell you to say, "Mm mm-hmm. All right. We want to say, run toward those hard things. Look at what 97% of people are doing and do the opposite. That's the theme of today's podcast. Morgan, what is an instance in your life personally where your initial reaction is, "Mm, that's scary, don't do that, that's gonna be pain, but then because you know that it's good for you, you do it anyways. Uh, I have a great example of this. It doesn't necessarily require pain, but speaking on stage is something that's hard for me. And a lot of people will say, well, I didn't even think that would ever be a thing with you because when I watch you speak on stage, you do a good a good job. But leading into Summit every year, I'm like super nervous because that's a hard thing for me. Public speaking is a hard thing for me, but I I do execute, right? And so that's, mm-hmm. I think, the message today is like, hey, you got to lean into the hard things because if you are just constantly afraid of being uncomfortable, then you will never grow. And I will say I've got over time, I've gotten more confident speaking. Whereas if I just said no, because it was a hard thing and I was scared, if I said no back in 2016 at our first summit, how would I get to where I am today? Mm-hmm. I was, we were upstairs at, uh, at uh, Jacksonville at our summit and watching you prepare as you were staring out the window, you were just like, you were, you clearly um, prepared very, very, very well because of that. Was it because of that reason that you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you, when you stand on stage in front of your entire organization and you are expected to deliver a great message and you need to be poised and you need to look like you're, you know, what you're talking about and you're confident, which I am all those things. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, getting on stage is definitely not something that's very natural to me. So for me, it's all in the preparation and I've got to know my talk track. I've got to practice it. I've got to get my jitters out. And then once I step on stage, honestly, it all goes away. Mm -hmm. As soon as I get on stage, it all goes away. But leading up to it, I get super, super nervous. Um, And so that's just been a hard thing. And that's something I am actually now leaning into more and more this year. I've hired a coach that's going to help me speak better, that's going to help me prepare speeches because I have a desire to do that more and more because I think it it's an opportunity for me to get my message out and to impact women. And so, hey, if I don't focus on the hard things, then I'll never reach some of these goals that I have. And, um, Listen, the stage for me is going to get bigger and bigger, mm-hmm. right? As, as Burn Boot Camp grows, the audience is going to grow and grow and grow. And so I know right now is the time for me to lean into this hard thing and do it every time I have that opportunity and don't run from it. Yeah, it was really inspiring to watch how hard you prepared for it. And you went out there and you absolutely killed it. Good job. Thank that was you. great. Well, that was great. You know, you always help me. You always have my back. Yeah, we do like, we'll do like pitching and catching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we call it pitching and catching. She'll just like, give her speech to me and I'll give mine back to her and we give each other like advice and stuff. It's great. Um, for me, when I was first, when we were first starting, it was the words, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Those the words, words know. were scary to me. Mm-hmm. Um, not like being inadequate, I think was uh, at the root cause of it. Probably the most fearful thing for me coming from a family where, um, you know, if my father just, he knew everything and it there was no, he was never wrong. And so I grew up emulating, you know, some of his tendencies and I would carry that over as an entrepreneur thinking that I needed to solve everyone's problems all the time and have all the answers. And the byproduct of having all the answers is you become the chief everything officer, not the chief executive officer and, and, um, not being able to provide the answers to the people that were confiding in me to provide them the answers was a very scary thing. And so I always just pretended like I knew all the answers until I was 28 or 29, probably right after we had Cameron when she was born and I was holding this like beautiful little baby girl. And like, I think it was like one hand, like, oh, what do I do? I have no idea. I don't know what to do. And so I'll always, I'll probably always credit her with humbling me in a way, uh, not only humbling me from, um, um, from the lens of like 
how what motivates me and like like really under uncovering what the true motivations of life are but also you know allowing me just that confidence to be insecure you know yeah. and that's such a weird thing to say like the confidence to be insecure and what i really mean by that is like confidently saying that i don't know mm -hmm. like i i don't know and but i want to know i want to know the answers and i want you to know the answers and so like let's figure this out together mm -hmm. And that's been a definite evolution for me. Yeah. It was it was scary for a long time. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's it's scary to be vulnerable yeah. because what happens when you're vulnerable? Like you open yourself up to be judged and for people to you know maybe not believe in you. And that's probably it's such a deep fear for you with your background with your father. Is gosh, if I do one thing wrong, will they lose belief in me? And right. you you that was such a. Uh, belief was such a scarcity for you growing up that you would have held on to that no matter what. And so I think, though, anyone that, you know, is leading a company or building a company and that requires you to get people to be bought into your vision, into your brand, you do want to you do want them to be confident in you. And so for you to admit, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to surround myself with the people that do it. I'm going to be I'm going to be wide open. Mm -hmm. It gives people permission to do the same. You know, and, and that's what we need more leaders of like just humbling themselves. I agree. And what, we need more people in society, I think, to accept that. Yeah, I think, yeah, from a judgmental standpoint, especially like who are you to judge someone else if you don't clean your car or if your room's dirty? Mm -hmm. Like before you judge someone else, you should probably you should probably clean up those uh, six day old McDonald's wrappers off your floor, uh, floorboard of your car there. <laughs> Because, no, I'm serious. And here's why. Because how could you possibly cast a judgment on another human being when your your life it's your life isn't together yet? And for me, I didn't really realize that until I got I got older that that was like my basically like my upbringing was like my parents judging me with in, without ever taking a look in the mirror and, and judging themselves and you know, so I always, obviously as a young adolescent kid, you get caught up in that because you want love unconditionally, unconditionally from your parents. But instead, when you get judgment cast toward you, you get used to it. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's like at this point in my life, you can judge me and God can judge me. Maybe Cameron, Max is not old enough yet and Ryan's not old <laughs> enough yet either. So other than- Max is getting there He's, he's getting there. He's, he's getting, getting there. there. I think he told you this morning that you were being rude to him. Well, if he stopped, if he stops peeing in his pants, <laughs> then I'll listen to him. <laughs> hey, whatever. He was- uh, Yeah, because I took his iPad after I told him not that yeah. he wasn't allowed to watch the YouTube uh, yep. show anymore. Yep. He, uh, he got mad at me. He said, dad, you're rude. Yeah, you're being rude. <laughs> no, um, but I think judgment, it's interesting because- I have a different experience with judgment, and I think I didn't really get a taste of it until burn, whereas, like, you had it growing up. You had, you know, other other parents judging you. You had people judging your family, and you've learned to kind of just, like, let it roll off your back. That is one hard thing that has come to me, I think, as we've built burn is I've opened ourselves up. We've opened ourselves up, and in turn, you are – opening yourselves up to judgment mm -hmm. and everybody having an opinion about you, good and bad, right? Like it's not all bad and, and, and it's really good sometimes. And that's what you hold on to of just people knowing you and knowing your heart. But gosh, in the last, you know, 10 years, we've had people judge um, everything about our lives, right? And, and say things and say comments. And it and, started right away too. You remember that? Right like away. right like, away. You know, I remember that reading a blog about myself uh, back, like 10 years ago when there was like when blogging was a much bigger thing and it, it was like this whole nasty blog about me and how I was like I didn't smile enough. <laughs> and yeah. like um, They called me the muscle head that only liked to help the pretty girls. Yeah. And like they were mad that, I, like, that I was driving a Range Rover. And like I remember like getting I don't even know how we found that blog. But it was like a thread. It, it was, was some a thread, thread and it was nasty. And it was it was, of course, hard on my heart because I'm like, what? Like people don't like me, <laughs> you know, like I mean. I think I, I've I've just grown up loving other people and just not judging people. Like my parents just did not instill that in me, and um, and I've minded my own business for the most part. Like yeah, I'm sure I've gone through phases in like you know high school and stuff where I was not nice to other people, and I wish I could go back and change that about me. But anyways, I just I I think I've I've lost faith sometimes in like humanity just because of the things I've gotten in my DMs in you know, written about me, said about me, 
But at the end of the day, I also know that some people just need hugs, Mm -hmm. need to be loved. And those people that are really like lashing out or having judgment towards you, they really just are lacking love in a way. And and I wish I could give it to them, Mm -hmm. you know, because I I, I have to not take that stuff personal um, unless it's someone that knows me and then I'm going to listen. And I think that's just an age old rule is like, hey, unless someone knows you, don't don't take their advice or don't take their judgment. Um, But that's still been hard for me because I I care a lot about I care too much about what people think of me. Um, And I'm proud of you, though, because what through all that you kept your heart and your mind open. What happens most time most often is somebody will get, you know, they'll get some stones thrown their way and then they'll curl up and they'll never come outside again. But you just kept walking like steadfast through that. And to me, that's, I mean, I always knew that you would react to judgment that way because that's just who you are. That's why I married you. Like, not, I mean, you're beautiful and you're so pretty, but your character. We just get, we go to well, the but you're, but you're, you like my beach hair. But you weren't letting me finish. But yeah. your character is by far the most attractive thing about you. Mm-hmm. And you're welcome. And you know that. <laughs> and the looks don't hurt. But yeah. your your character and, and the fact that you remained open, what it, what that does is it really, it really galvanizes you in a way like, it calluses your mind to, or filter might be a better word. It, like if, it, cause you can't cal- callous. So it means like almost, oh, you can't touch me. Like you can't mm-hmm. like, no, you hear those things. Like you can't yeah. not hear it, but you filter it to say like, okay, we talked about our, our force field of our family and we said, all right, well, we're going to go do this hard thing. We're going to build this huge company. We have to the moon goals. Like everyone that we're going to tell these goals to are, is, are going to think that we're bad shit crazy that we're nuts that no way can you do that and good because that really shows you in your life who is riding with you and who's dying mm-hmm. who's going to be a part of the mission and who who maybe maybe they're a great person then likely they they're a great are a person, person. Yeah. and like you said there might be a moment in time when they have some vulnerability in their lives and you know to make themselves feel better they lash out and you know have to deploy empathy back and, and realize that people have a lot of stuff going on and that lo- life is mostly, you know, malevolence and tragedy and it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. But then you have that those people that make that filter, right? And, and, and you can cherish those people more mm-hmm. because they're in your life and they love you because you're you. Not, not because you're doing the hard things, but they love you because you're you and what you stand for and your character. And so for me, the the judgment that I grew up with was my filter's been running now since I was like 10, 11, when I could like comprehend, you know, for those of you that don't know, my father was in and out of jail and prison and my, my mom left when I was a little boy, um, basically raised myself and my siblings from the time I was 11 or 12 years old. And, you know, to, to deal with those things, to deal with the judgment of those things in your community, being the young boy who's parents have that track record well that's what morgan means when she says oh you're you got judged a lot by other people so i've been running that filter and i mean you're here and i'm we met when we were 12 and i feel like i feel like it works i feel like mm-hmm. if you just if you just let it come into your life right don't get too high when people are like praising you and don't get too low when people are judging you mm-hmm. baseball taught me that it's just to stay even keeled throughout 142 game minor league season that your results are going to be better um, when they're unemotional. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What do you do in your life that's hard personally every day? Something that you not, we got a little esoteric there for a minute talking about, you know, judgment, life. judgment and life in the past and I all that's all that's relevant. Day, but like, what's hard. like a, what's like a physical thing? Not something like judgment. That's just a thing, but like a physical thing that you do every day. I got one and then I'll let you go. Okay. I drink suja. Green juice, Uber greens, and it tastes like eight ounces of grass mixed with water every day. And it's hard and it's disgusting. I don't feel like I want to throw up, but I'm building health in my body. And I know that. So I'll plug my nose and I will drink that eight ounce. And you see me do it every day. Yeah. We've been out the last Although, two days. Although there's like a suja greens shortage. Is there? You cannot find it at the grocery store. Really? Right yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been missing for two days. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm, I'm. Two weeks. Yeah. 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 Well, I had some backups. But yeah, that's hard. I mean, to do that every thing about that. How many people do you know that do that? Probably not a lot. I don't either. But well, because it's lot. gross. It's yeah. disgusting. It really is. I don't do anything extreme like that. So like I'm I don't drink like 
a green juice every day. I don't wake up and do a cold shower. Maybe this is a wake up call for me. I need to do more physically hard things in my day. Um, you take 45 minutes of camp every day. Not every day. Well, give yourself some credit. Yeah. What is every day? You can't work out every day if you tried. But five days a week on average, maybe four, five four. days a week. Four. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's every other day. How about yeah. that? Okay. Well, that's really hard. That's okay. If that counts, then I work it out totally for 45 counts. minutes at Burn Boot Camp. That okay. That's what I do. Tell me you haven't sat in the parking lot oh, at least one time, yes. pulled up, and then yes. turned around and went home. I have done that. Didn't you? I have done that. Although, here's the thing. I Tell go, me. I go to the office every day, and it's it's upstairs. So, And I've got teammates now that are like, hey, we're going to camp. So that helps to have an accountability. Because there's times I'll be like, oh, I'll just... I'll just take this meeting or I'll just work on this and then we'll go to camp. Right. But then someone grabs me and we go. You just go. Just do it. And then you guess what? You always feel better. When you yeah. Go. Yeah. Yes. Also, uh, we live about what, five miles our house from the office. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, I will elect to jog to the office, even though I'm also not don't a do that. huge fan. <laughs> I think, so back in the day when I, I was a basketball player and back in the day, we used to play ball like out in the street. And I remember a specific time when I get at a brand new ball and I brought my old dusty ball that has been through hundreds and hundreds of games. And um, the ball that we used to play the game, uh, the choice was given to me. And I chose my dusty old ball versus the brand new ball. And this was a, although I, I have no idea why I remember this out of all the instances, but. I feel like that was the seed plant the very first time when I was like, it doesn't matter what the tool is. It doesn't matter what the environment is. It doesn't matter my surroundings. I'm just going to flat out be better than you. I'm just going to beat you. you. I'll beat you with your ball. I'll beat you with the old crappy ball. I'll beat you with no ball. You want to go, we want to play this game. All right. I'm, you know, like the, there was like this mindset of it like when the hard things are introduced and you embrace the hard things, it actually is a competitive advantage. Do you believe that? Yeah, because most people won't do the hard things. Ooh. So like we said in the beginning, you know, most people run away from the hard things. But if you lean into the hard things and you do the hard things, you come out on the other end better and stronger, like a better version of yourself. And But you got to do it consistently. Like that's the biggest thing is like you – there's no instant gratification when it comes to this type of stuff, right? And I think that's what so many people are seeking these days is like instant gratification. Well, I did it for two weeks. Why didn't I lose the weight? Yep. Or I did it for two weeks or I did it for two months. Like, why didn't I get the raise, right? It's mm -hmm. consistency. Mm -hmm. And so doing hard things here and there, that's that's great. But it's got to be consistent over time where you're doing hard things. And um, that's when you should expect rewards, not instantly, though. Yeah. That's a big distinction. Like, Yeah, for sure. I mean. You're going to speak on stage in California at Brooke Thomas's Live Out Loud event. Shout out, Brooke. What's up? Excited. Well, I'm going to come with you to support, and I'm excited to see you get up on stage and rip it. <laughs> Drop the mic. And um, I want to know, because this is like your hard thing, do you have nerves going into this? Are you? Not yet. Okay. Uh, there's a timeline, okay. right? Like I'm good. I'm feeling good. I'm excited. Let's do this. And then as time will creep up, I'm going to get a little bit more nervous, a little bit no more nervous leading into it. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm doing things differently this time. Tell me. I'm preparing a lot further out for this next speaking engagement. Um, and whereas Summit, I'll be honest, like I was, I was running Summit. I was like planning Summit. I didn't have time to think about my talk track as much as I would have wanted to. So this time I'm not planning an event going into it. And I, I think I'm going to have much more like um, practice and I will be more comfortable going into it. So here's the thing. Don't keep do, like, don't keep doing the same things too and expect like different results. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can't expect to be more confident on stage unless I put in work right. ahead of time. Right. Um, I can't just think just because I'm doing it again and more reps, this is going to be a completely different topic that I normally talk about. Um, it's not going to be my organization in front of me. It's going to be like 120 women that have never met me. You know what I mean? So there's going to be, it's different dynamics. So that will create different nerves, but 
I have to do something different on the front end to change the result. Yeah. Well, I'm ex- really excited for that and proud of you for um, continuing to jump off of the plane with no parachute, <laughs> proverbially at, le- at least. So th- speaking of that, like, like, you know, doing things before you know whether or not they're going to work out. I think that's probably a theme in a lot of people's lives. Like, I don't want to, uh, it, it, mm. I don't want to try that yet because I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, it seems really scary. How do you think about, it's like, I, th- I think about this in goal setting. I set probably the most ridiculous goals out of anyone you know, I would assume. Yeah. And that's all burden too. That's a hard thing because now I have to go convince people that all these crazy goals are actually feasible, that they're actually possible. And if you were to just take them in face value, you know, building 10,000 locations or even 500 like we're at now, it's like, mm, probably not going to happen. And I even think those things, like I get it, it's natural human behavior to um, take the unprecedented and, and doubt it and squish it. So in goal setting alone, when I step up to, you know, with my pen and my paper and I try to write the goals out that we have for ourselves or our organization, I try and I try intentionally to think of the most difficult things possible to pursue because my philosophy is what is life if it's not the pursuit of difficulty if it's not introducing fear or doubt in front of you and then showing yourself what you're actually made of by overcoming those things um that's it's it's a it's People don't have a problem setting goals. Mm -hmm. People have a problem setting their goals too low Mm -hmm. because they want to be able to give themselves that pat on the back and they want certainty that they're not going to fail. And they won't set their goals any higher because if there's any doubt that creeps in, what happens, (laughs) it's interesting, but what happens is a person that doesn't set those high goals and that sets low goals actually either or, or either doesn't set goals at all is staying in obscurity almost on purpose so that they don't eventually have to face that letdown of maybe not getting there. Yeah, it's called the comfort zone. Yeah, but for me, it's like I don't expect to reach the goals. The goals are so stupid and crazy and wild that they're possible but highly improbable. Yeah. Highly improbable goals. And then there's no expectation of actually hitting them. And it's like, hey, we're going to set these big goals because if we reach for the stars, we'll fall in the clouds. If we reach for the clouds, we fall in the cement. And this is where Devin and I differ. Is that why there was a hesitation in that uh, response? A little pause there? Because when you're running a large organization, you have people that are trying to hit goals because their bonus is tied to it or maybe their performance is tied to it. And so um, if you have an expectation that people aren't going to hit goals, then that's very hard to performance manage somebody. Well, just to be clear, to we don't tie our ability. goals, our performance, ba- we don't tie our ambitious goals to money ever. Yeah. Every year we go in using the last yeah, trailing 12 months history. We have history. two sets of goals. We yeah. have Devin's crazy vision goals. And then we have, what are the numbers telling us that we're going to do? And how do we stretch just a little bit? Yeah. Um. So th- there are two differences. And this is where like him and I, you know, you and I are just two different mindsets when it comes to yeah, well, if you were the same, that would not, I don't think no, that would work out good. very well. When um, going to bed's hard for me. Oh, not me. To I shut hit, it off. I hit that pillow and I'm out. I know. It's great. I know. <laughs> I wish, like, I honestly wish I could be more like you in that regard. Uh, I need, like, my head spins. I have lots of ideas and my head spins. It's very hard for me to go to bed at night. You know what makes it easier, though, is when all the lights are off. And like there is complete darkness. <laughs> There's not nudge, nudge, hint, hint. I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should just get rid of all the TVs at our house. We should just get rid oh, of. Oh, I all don't the... have TV. You're talking about the hatch light. Aren't oh, I'm you? talking about the hatch light. I'm talking about the CPI light. I'm talking about the hallway light. I'm talking about um, Netflix that's running through the 13th oh, don't episode. Even, don't. Go I'm not there saying. Netflix. I'm not I don't saying watch it's Netflix you. Every I'm not saying night. it's you. Yeah. I'm guilty. I'm guilty by association. We just watched one series, Lincoln Lawyer, then, and, it, and then tonight we won't watch any TV. And it, we stopped watching it at episode three, and it played to episode like seven. Oh, and I'm sl- and I like, was sleeping. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very hard for me to go. So I think we should just like try to do our very best to just make the room completely okay. pitch back black and dark, so that 
can't even see in front of you, that would okay. make my life you know a what I'm little bit you? easier. I'm going to get you a little eye mask. Oh, no. That it's just pitch black no matter what's happening around you. Okay. Well, okay. we'll as long as you don't, as long as you're not snapping photos of me and putting them on the internet. I won't. Okay. All right, two more hard things uh, because I want everyone to. I want you. You didn't. You got to do a personal hard thing. I'm not letting you skate on that I, one. So you think about it for you a minute. Just, I, we talked about my workouts. We did talk about your workouts. Yeah, you asked me what I did personally, and I said, "Well, I don't drink green juice, and I don't do like cold showers." So we we landed on I. I do what about workouts. from a mom standpoint? And I'll do one from a dad standpoint. Um, I would say a hard thing from a parenting standpoint for me is. Just creating energy <laughs> for them. Yeah. At the um, end of the day, ener- like end of the day yeah, energy. Yeah. Like, you know, um, it's just like that second half of the day that when you come home from work, it's, you got to pull energy out of you. Like you're more mentally tired than you are like physically or anything, but your kids expect full, like full on mommy mode and let's play and let's go to the park and let's do this and let's do that. And all I want to do is decompress. Right. And so the hard thing to do would be to just sit on the couch and watch TV. And sometimes I do that. So no judgment for the moms that do that or the dads that do that, because sometimes we do just need to veg out if it's been a day. But I think the hard thing to do is, you know, create that energy at five o'clock where you're going to create memories and, and, all of that in a two hour yeah. span. Yeah. That's hard for me. Like, I'll be honest, like it's hard. And um, I love being a mom and I love working. And so I haven't like, there's not a way for me to sacrifice one or the other. I just figure a way out a way to do it because they're both important to me. So, um, but I got, the I got a routine. You want me to hear, you want me, you want me to share my routine so that you can, you can maybe steal it on the way home. Remember the 1995, 96 Chicago Bulls anthem? No, I don't. You don't? I don't, no. I mean, if I heard it, but I, you know me. I'm not like, I don't have history. In okay, cue in history. right here. Cue in 1995 Chicago Bulls anthem. And it says, and now your starting lineup for the Chicago Bulls. And it does it. I don't I know the rhythm right now, but we, we just played it. So you do that. I'm going to have them cut it in. And I turn that all the way up. And... Um, I know Max and Ryan are going to run at me as soon as I get home because that's what the boys do. They run right at me. And so I literally jack myself up for like the seven-minute car ride home, and I'll play the Bulls anthem, and it's like I'm, it's like game time. And I honestly – and I know it sounds a little funny, and I'm we're kind of being silly on this podcast a little bit, but I'm serious because it's very, very, very important to me to pick my kids up when I get home. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. I want to be the dad that no matter how old their kids are, like, like I'm going to, I'm going to be strong enough to physically always pick you guys up. Like that's, that's a physical goal, but mentally too, like I want to be able to mentally pick you up when I get home and I never want them to see like a tired iota on my face when I get home. Although, you know, I'm tired like 99% of the time when I get home, but it's my job at, at that hour and a half to you really own the mornings, right? So, so everyone knows. Morgan really owns the mornings. I own the days, but that's okay. And let's, well, if you're going to give me no credit, then no, I, you I don't you have credit. to give me any credit. I, I think credit. I should have credit for being the one for an hour and a half that does physical, like physical activity with these kids. We're like rolling around, playing ninjas. I'm a tiger one minute. I'm a ninja the next. We're in a forest the next minute. Then we have to go outside in the front and in the back. And you do those things too. I'm not saying it's like mutually exclusive, but I like get sweaty mm. and I like have to gear myself up for that. It's very hard. It's very hard to do that consistently every day. But what's harder though to me is my kids growing up without, when them saying, oh, my dad was you know, too tired to play with me when he got home or my dad worked all the time because he was building burn. So, you know, it's just what he does. Like I, you don't, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Like you can be a great dad and you can be a great entrepreneur you just can't do much outside of those two things. Yeah. <laughs> they, they say you can have one hobby outside of work. Yeah. Mine's my kids. Same. Same. All yeah, right. It's so hard. I have two hard things, and then we're going. Okay? This is a challenge. All right. The hard, th- the hard challenge that I want everyone on this podcast to take away um, is for the next two weeks. It's a two-week hard challenge. Okay? I want you to go five for five at camp 
or five for five in a demanding workout if you're not a burn member. That means you commit Monday through Friday for two weeks straight and you do not miss a single workout. That's number one. Number two is that in that two week span, you get up. I don't care what time it is, but you have the discipline to get up at the same time every day, whether it's Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. If it ends in day, you get up at the same time and you go and you do that same demanding 45 minute camp or workout if you're not a member at Burn. That to me is a good little challenge to get you started because at the end of that two weeks, I want you to realize that you're capable of doing the hard things. If you just set out a simple template for yourself, 10 days, two things to do for 10 days, you can do this, all right? So that's my challenge. What do you think, Morg? I like it. I like it. All right. Well, let me know. DM us on Instagram, devin.klein, morgan.a.klein mm-hmm. on Instagram, and let us know. Take the, take our two-week challenge and do the hard things so that you get better as a human being and a byproduct is you become more confident, be more empowered, and then the more you do the hard things, the less hard they seem over time. Right? That's right. Claps on two. All right. One, two.